Now I'm going to pass it over to Jenny Trainer, our associate curator at the museum and one of the curators for the paper routes. Welcome yeah. to watch 2020 exhibition. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Julia. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm I'm really excited for today. Um, my co-curator Orin Zara has been spearheading many of these lately, so um, I'm happy to be back in the saddle um, and kind of. Um, shepherd this conversation along with, with Julia. I had the opportunity to speak with her last week a little bit about her work and you guys are in for a really big treat. So I'm really excited. I just wanted to say a few words um, as we usually do about the Women to Watch exhibition series. That is a, a series that we have been um, presenting in conjunction with our committees, our wonderful volunteer committees um, since 2008, every two to three years, we have an exhibition um, whereby our committees work with um, contemporary curators in their regions to identify either up and coming artists or under chronically underrepresented artists um, in a particular theme that we're working in. And usually that theme is a, a medium material. Um, some of you might remember summer 2018, we had the heavy metal exhibition that I curated, and that was um, 20 artists from 20 different committees, all working in metal. And it was really uh, amazingly uh, diverse group of objects all made out of metal. And so when Orin and I were talking about paper, we thought that this was a material that was also equally um, adaptable and surprising um, in the way that different artists are, are using it. And so we really aim to create an exhibition that showed the diversity and approaches um, to this material. And uh, we have 22 artists this year. It's our largest Women to Watch ever. And unfortunately, um, the universe had other plans for all of us, and so things have not gone quite according to schedule, but we are planning to open the exhibition um, at the museum in October, on October 8th, and um, we just are really appreciative to all of the committees and the artists for their uh, flexibility and their understanding during this time. Um, Julia is the artist that is representing our San Francisco committee, San Francisco Advocacy for NIMWA, and that is under the leadership of Lorna Meyer Callis and Carol Parker, so I wanted to extend our sincere thanks to them, as well as their consulting curator, Claudia Schmuckley, um, who's a curator at the, the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco, and she was really able to together a wonderful group of artists working in paper um, for us to to look at and to consider. Um, one thing that I like to 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 say out loud um, whenever I'm talking about women to watch and, and this program is that it's not it's not a competition per se. It's not about um, choosing the quote unquote best artist out of a bunch um, because they're all amazing they're in their own way, they're all doing completely different things. It's really about creating a cohesive exhibition from all of these disparate parts and wanting to show that variety of the material. Um, so I think you'll see what we were drawn to, what Aureen and I were drawn to in Julia's work as she, as she talks about it. Um, she is coming to paper from a really interesting um, angle, a really interesting place. Um, incorporating a little bit of the history of um, paper making, um, as well as really thinking um, conceptually about the material itself. Um, Julia earned her MFA from the California College of the Arts and her BA from Tufts University. She's had a number of residencies and fellowships. She's very accomplished. Um, she had a, a studio apprenticeship at Judah. Is it Dieudonne or Dieudonne? Dieudonne. Dieudonne. Um, in New York, which is a very famous um, paper making uh, mill and studio. She's been the recipient of uh, multiple awards, um, also nominated for multiple awards, including a two time nominee for the very prestigious Joan Mitchell Foundation Award. 
Uh, she's currently represented uh, by a gallery in San Francisco, Uquinam Gallery. And Carolyn will send out um, an email after, um, after our session today with, with links to Julia's website and more information about her. So you'll be able to explore a little bit more on your own, all the wonderful things that she has done and accomplished. So um, with that, I would like to turn the floor over to Julia. And Julia, we talked a little bit about um, the format of this. And so you've prepared a, a slideshow for us that we'll kind of go through. Um, but I think that our hope is to have this be a little bit more conversational. So um, I, I will be keeping an eye on the questions as well as Carolyn. And so as things come up, I'll, I'll kind of interject those. That sounds great. Um, thank you so much to everybody joining us today. Um, and I want to thank Carolyn and Ginny and all the NIMWA staff who've been so wonderful to work with. Um, and I also want to thank the NIMWA San Francisco group, which has been so generous and heartfelt with their support throughout this process. Um, and Claudia Schmuckley and Jana Keegan from the De Young Museum, who curated the exhibition here in San Francisco, where I was lucky enough to show alongside with um, Sofia Cordova, Sandra Ono, Lava Thomas, and Amy Tavern, four women artists that I really admire. Um, I thought we'd start off with the two bodies of work that I'll be sharing at NIMWA this fall. And Carolyn's the pilot of the slideshow, so thank you, Carolyn, for guiding us through. Um, my father passed away almost 13 years ago, and this led to a huge shift in my life, but also in my art practice. Um, what we're looking at here is a wood carving of the 11 month period, fought starting with the night he died. 11 months is the traditional mourning period for a Jewish child to say the morning prayer for their parent. Um, and after my father passed away, I was really struck by the simple fact that I couldn't touch him anymore. And it made me crave texture in a very intense way and completely reject flatness, um, which is a interesting urgency with making paper. Um, and it also shifted my relationship to the studio as a place where I could create my own rituals, adapt traditions, and slow down and make time and space for life-changing experiences. Um, so this in front of you is the wood carving that I made. It's a um, 33 by 46 inches. The phases of the moon at their deepest point are um, carved out about a half inch deep. And if we can go to the next slide. Um, making handmade paper is labor intensive. Making handmade paper the way I make it on this scale is particularly labor intensive, but it's really a way to physically experience in this project in particular, is a way to physically experience grief and move it through my system physically and then to the emotions. Um, to make this work, I gathered junk mail in my neighborhood. I ripped it by hand. I soaked it in water. I blended it with a kitchen blender, strained it, and then pressed it by hand into the wooden mold using my body weight to extract all the water out of the paper that I can. And then the paper dries on the wooden mold until it's bone dry, peeling it away. So it's not an embossed surface, it's like, a, it's a cast surface. Um, the next slide. So that's a detail up top. So the surface really almost reads like braille. Um, and um, this was a series that I made. I, I revisited the mold 11 times. Below is nine of the pieces hanging in space. So there's 11 calendars from this project. And it actually was a, a calendar, a way of marking time. I had daily rituals that went along with this whole project that I won't get into right now, but um, the repetition of labor and ritual and um, to cover that full period of time was really important for me. Um, and then one other thing I'll say about the labor of the project is ripping paper to make paper took on new meaning for me. Um, in the Jewish tradition by the graveside, you would um, 
tear your garment over your heart and that act of ripping is exposes one's heart in a time of grief at the conclusion of the mourning period you sew that um, tear up and so there's healing but a scar and that's something that i've definitely carried through um, into my work so the next slide thanks carolyn um, in 2019 i gave birth to our son and during my pregnancy, this felt like a great counterbalance in my life to losing my father. And I wanted to mark the experience with um, parallel gravity. And so um, it was important to me to honor bringing a life into the world with the same, in the same way that I had let go of a life. And um, the first thing I made after our son was born was this hand carved wooden mold based on the dimensions, the same system that I'd used to mourn for my father. But instead of the 11 months mourning, you see the 41 weeks of my pregnancy. Um, and this marked the second major time in my life when I felt like I needed more time to process um, pregnancy and birth and life with a newborn than is conventionally set aside in American culture. Um, and Julia, I just, I just want to jump in and say that uh, we haven't seen the final works together yeah. yet, but that was that was really something um, that caught my eye that we talked a little bit about last week. Um, well, maybe I'll wait till you show them together. <laughs> oh, that's the next slide, so that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so on the left is, th this pair is called waning and waxing, and on the left um, is a piece of um, paper that I cast from the wood mold that I had made 12 years ago. And on the right is a piece of handmade paper cast from the wood mold that I made right after my son was born. Um, and it was really a meditation on the relationships between dying and giving birth as more than opposite ends of a spectrum, which we talked about, Jenny, I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, and in my life in particular, it was a way for me to digest my complicated labor experience and what it means to lose a parent before giving birth to a child, um, and how the loss of my father informs how I love my son. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is the the pairing of the events, those two time frames side by side. Yeah, and this this was the work of yours that really just hooked me, um, both because it's 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 technically really beautiful. Um, but also that that pairing of these two major turning points in anyone's life, the loss of a parent and the birth of a child, and how um, oftentimes the feelings of those two things happening can really mirror each other. Um, very you know, very strong emotions. And um, although I'm, you know, I'm I'm blessed that I still have both of my parents having having had children and especially that first time when your world just completely changes there is that period of grief as well because you're kind of grieving the life that you had mm -hmm. and and preparing for this new life and i would imagine in a similar way losing a parent is also you know um that experience of of course you know grieving for the absence of that person but but really grieving for that that life that you had with them that will be no more. Yeah, and I would say that making this piece right after giving birth was also me grasping back from my identity as an artist and not just getting fully consumed by motherhood. Um, yeah. I, and then the next slide that I'd love to, so just, um, where 11 months mourning was made out of um, pulped paper these pieces are made out of fabric, some of which came from our home. Um, and the image, the fabrics that you see were the different color fabrics determine the colors of the pieces. So I don't add any pigments or dyes and I'll talk about that more later. But one thing that I wanna point out in this is, as you'll see, like particularly on the left side in the details that there's a, a hot pink glow behind the piece. So I backed the pieces, I, I pulped a hot, hot pink t-shirts and so the backside is lined with this warm color. And it was really important for me um, 
that it feel like this work has a life force that it not just be dark and shadow with a void. I really wanted there to be a, a back glow to it. Um, and then over the years, I've experimented with different drying techniques and I've figured out ways to let the forms kind of dry on their own and have this more undulating form that feels more lifelike, less rigid and more imperfect. And I'm really embracing that with this body of work, how it hangs on the wall. So um, the next, um, the second body of work that I will be showing at the museum this fall, I made during an artist residency at Recology San Francisco, which is also known as The Dump. It, um, and Recology ho has been hosting a residency program for over th for 30 years now, where artists work on site, scavenge materials from the dump, from this room that you see right here, and then work in a studio in the neighboring building and then show that work. Um, and it's, as a grad student and as an artist, it's, it's all I wanted to do for the longest time. Um, and so it was a dream place for me to really dive into the um, history of rag paper, which is um, so many people are unaware of, but um, basically it's the story of between the 1600s and the 1800s as the capability for printmaking is taking off, paper mills are trying to keep up with this new demand and the raw material that they are depending on are the rags gathered by peddlers from women from the different homes around villages. And so all of a sudden this exhausted material has huge value and the women's labor to gather the, mater the materials also has this huge value. Um, and so I really want to dive into that history that mostly is between the 1600s and 1800s and make work about that time period using fabrics that I pulled from this building, pulped, um, and then worked within the studio. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I can give you. Uh, and so I was expecting to work, like I said, with the 1600, 1800 time period, but I was blown away to discover that um, in San Francisco, we were recycling rags into the 60s. Um, it wasn't for paper making purposes, but that was part of our sanitation system. And in fact, I discovered in an interview with a retired employee that when, um, older Italian immigrant women were sorting rags on site out of public view until 1964 at Recology. And in our interview, he was able to remember seven of these women's names, most of whom were relatives of sanitation workers. Um, and one of those seven women's names was Rita Bianchi. And so I wanted to honor these women's labor. Um, I pulled plywood from the dump. Um, I also pulled printed material from the dump. And um, for example, Rita Bianchi, I made from a 1950s opera program. And I rearranged the letters to say her name, then carved them backwards into discarded um, plywood, and then worked with pulp that I pulled from the dump, hand pressed it, into the wood carving and then you get the piece that reads forward here and this is one of a set of seven pieces mm -hmm. if we go to the next slide so i wanted to honor the labor of rita bianchi olga vera Giuseppina calagri maria tringale alda campi emma Mudio, and josefina grasso and connect these women's labor to the anonymous anonymous women who were saved and, sort, and sorting rags 350 to 150 years before them. Um, and it was important for me to do this not with ink, but with shaping the fibers similar to the ones that they had handled. Um, a body of work of yours that really just captivated me. Um, I, I just, I love, I just love everything about it. I love the history. I love the amazing skill that goes into, I mean, I cannot imagine how time, yes, thank you, Carolyn, how time consuming um, and how delicate that work is. And even that process playing into this um, larger one of women's labor that is often very kind of repetitive and um, um, very, you know, precise and thinking about embroidery, stitching, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, um, 
this was a really special project for me. This was in terms of site specificity, matching up material, my labor echoing the rag sorters labor of two different time periods. Um, it's kind of a, a dream moment to line up. So, Julia, you mentioned that in the 60s, they weren't using the rags for paper. So why, why were they sorting them? Yeah, so the rags that were being sorted in the 1600s were very different than the rags being sorted in the 1960s. Um, polyester was invented in between the two time periods. So one of the primary things that the women were doing were separating synthetic from natural fibers. And I believe each had its own diversion stream, like mm -hmm. way of being reusing, but it was not for paper making at that time. Um, but I met people who as kids remember setting aside the rags for a separate mm -hmm. trash collection. Um, I never had that experience, so it wasn't part of my consciousness. Yeah. And in fact, it's so interesting because very few people understand what rag paper is. That it's actually made from rags that came from home, like that history. And e even a lot of artists who use rag paper who say the term aren't familiar with the history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the next slide, Kelly. So made from similar materials the same materials but on a dramatically larger scale this is 200 year present uh, a commission from the contemporary jewish museum here in san francisco and it's 18 layers of handmade paper made from discarded bed sheets and t-shirts that are suspended from the ceiling and so this is based on a jewish folk tale about a a young man who arrives at the palace dressed in rags with no formal education and no wealth and he is chosen to be the king. And his way of leading the country is every day he stands in front of a mirror, he puts back on the rags that he arrived at the palace in and he looks in the mirror to remember where he came from in order to know how to move the country forwards. And I envisioned this project in 2016 during the election year and it was a, a wish, um, a wish for leadership with humility and long-term perspective, both backwards and forwards, historical and forward thinking. Um, the title 200 Year Present comes from uh, Elise Boulding, who I um, studied in undergraduates, um, Peace and Justice Studies. And Elise Boulding believed that we should be making decisions in the present moment, thinking three generations behind us and three generations ahead of us, or a hundred years behind us, a hundred years ahead of us. So this piece is the honors both the folktale and the Elise Boulding's um, story. The next piece or the next slide is a video so you can get a sense of how the piece is in space and what it's like to move in it. In, in the center, there's a four foot space so anybody can step into that leadership position. And as an artist, I realized that this really is the way that I want to take up space. I want to defy the expectations of a material that is perceived to be weak or vulnerable. And I want to find strength and stability that challenges our assumptions. Um, I want a low ecological footprint. Sustainability is foundational to my practice. And I want there to be a lightness in my work that allows a sensitivity and responsiveness to movement in the room. Uh, and this piece, Wolf Moon, I just wanted to, this is a great piece for me to slow down and talk about how I use color in my work. Um, I have been creating ways over the years to lengthen the amount of time I can spend actually building up pulp and um, making forms and working flat in a way that I can emphasize color. Um, and so um, how and why I mix color are really connected. Um, so no pigments or dyes are added. And I make color, you know, for example, this piece started off with a, a hot red orange t-shirt, and then a um, like a army green t-shirt. And all the colors you see in between are degrees of making a spectrum of color. That is like the degrees of mixing those two pulped fabrics together. Um, and the color mixing exercise really becomes a space to imagine the possibilities of connection or the collapse of distance between two or more people when they come undone together. Um, and to create this work, I use drawings as maps. And I'm really working 
with pulp in the liquid form that leads to the more organic edges, but I'm also controlling it to make these hard edge line separations between the segments. Um, but it's important to understand that this is one cohesive piece made slowly over the course of a week. In the detail on the right, it, it's hard to see, but you can kind of see the way, the way I make color is by mixing these fibers. So the fibers from the two different source fabrics entangle to make a new color or shade, but they still stay separate. You can see the different colored fibers separately and they have this vibrational quality that is really extremely satisfying to me. And I love working within the limitations of pre-existing colors as well. So how, how do you get those? I mean, they're, they're very straight lines in there. Um, yeah, I've, I, I have some magic tools. <laughs> I, I work with a plastic spoon. Uh, my husband's weights, we don't exercise anymore now that we have a kid, so I <laughs> use those and some, um, some uh, I have a lot of uh, straight edges. Okay. Has so I've been figuring out over the years how to do it, but basically how to work wet into wet, but dry it enough at once that I can still seam the work from the backside, mm. but have control. And that yeah. play of like loose and control is really important to me. Yeah, it, yeah, it looks like it's been, you know, all these separate pieces have come together like a, like a puzzle, but that it's all one piece is really amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, the next piece. Um, and while I've been working out different ways to work inside, I've also been figuring out ways to work outside. Um, I actually, my entry into art making as an adult was through mural making, and I love working outside, but I never fell in love with paint. As part of the 11 month morning project I, I showed you in the very beginning, there was a, a wheat pasting handmade paper component. But what I've realized over the years is that working with handmade paper outside is not about me leaving a mark, but it's about an opportunity to absorb, to listen, and to subtly shift public spaces. Um, so these are two earlier pieces that I made, junction on the left and tides on the right. These are the back sides. After I finish making them, they're fully pressed by hand and they are drying on site on the building. And I wait to peel them off once they're bone dry, weather permitting. Um, and I've been learning how to work this way on brick buildings and also on the concrete pad outside my studio. And now that I understand what I'm doing, my goal is you know, when we can leave home is to work on a wider range of buildings and surfaces beyond home. Mm -hmm. um, the next piece, is akimbo uh, and this is a, a corner piece that i made more recently um, and it's important for me for you to understand that all the colors that you're seeing again are pulped fabrics um, the exception to this is on the left side you can see the brick color that's actually um, the surface of the brick being pulled away lifted off the building by the dried pulp. And I love that the pulp kind of wins the tug of war between the brick and the fabric. You would assume it would go the other way. Um, and I just, I have to say, it's really important for me to take these materials from our private lives, from our personal spaces, and to see how they impact the exterior world or, or the public sphere. Um, the next slide, please. This is a detail shot. So the brick color you can see on the inside, um, on the left side was lifted off as well as on the right side on the top, the white paint was also lifted off of the building by the drying pulp. Um, and the, the, I'm really excited about the sculptural possibilities of the corner, thinking about it as a point of convergence and also as a turning point. Uh, and I should say that I'm working face down. So when I'm working on the building, I, it's not until the piece is totally dry and I lift it away from the building that I get to see the, the face of the piece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one exciting thing about working on the corner for me is that it allows me to show both the front and the back at the same time. It's letting me play with that, which is important because it shows that the color is not a surface treatment of the piece. It is the material, it is the integrity of mm -hmm. the piece. Mm -hmm. um, and also I, I put a lot of 
thought and mapping and planning into the front side of my work. But on the back side, I get to let go in a different playful way. And honestly, sometimes I'm just running out of colors and I'm, things happen in unexpected <laughs> ways that actually often delight me. And I, and I really want to be able to share both sides. Um, and I've really been thinking about like, in this area era of living in flat screens, how important it is to show more than one side it feels more mm -hmm. crucial. Yeah, and I think we talked a little bit um, when we spoke last week about just kind of, you know, this, this added meaning, meaning that your this kind of work has taken on, you know, bringing um, domestic materials into the public sphere. Um, I mean, I, I know it's hard to say where you think your work might go, but how do you, how do you see this moment in time really kind of um, playing into this part of your work? Can you hear my son in the background? Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, that just threw me. Um, how do I, well, I mean, I feel so, I think we're at a moment where we know where the weight of caretaking and our domestic lives are really coming to the surface in a whole new way during this, um, during the pandemic. And what is, we're reevaluating what is being seen as essential work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can tell you that my, the, the feeling I have about my materials is only deepening. I feel like only more committed to that. I, and I am excited to like go into different spaces and have the opportunity to interact with materials from specific places on the surfaces of specific buildings or um, surfaces. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I can show you some of the new work that I've actually been making since Shelter in Place started. Um, so getting to what we were saying, I mean, this time period feels so intensely domestic, um, not being able to leave our homes and with all of the caretaking responsibilities. Um, and I also, the, so many heightened emotions, anxiety, anger, grief, uncertainty, hope for transformation. Um, it really has me rethinking ways of incorporating the raw material, so the ripped fabrics, back into my work. Um, and I've been working in a few different ways in the studio. One that's more slow and meditative, and the, another which is quicker and more visceral. Um, both spaces I need to exist headwise. Um, this piece is called Sunset's Midwife, and it's made from a friend's um, bed sheet that she used, a dear friend's bed sheet that she used during her home birth seven years ago. And I've been holding on to the sheet for years now, not knowing what to do with it. But um, during this time period, you know, it was my son's first birthday, my anniversary, first anniversary of giving birth. And also my friend's sister was in her third trimester and about to go into labor, um, knowing that she wouldn't have all of her people around her um, to take care of them. And so I made this piece wanting to just put out sort of a protection there, um, sort of thinking of it as a shield or a protecting force for her, but for all the women going into labor and through newborn life under this wild time period. And really thinking about labor, I mean, as, as a moment of being torn open, transformation, healing, and, a, a, um, and especially in this time period. Um, and this is a body of work I wanna move through more, working with, I have another friend's home birth sheet, but also just with fabrics that have specific stories in them that kind of inform the shapes that I make with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a detail on the right. You can see the sheet is was a, a, a white sheet with a pink floral pattern. And so when I pulp it, it makes this very light pink colored pulp. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next slide. The next slide, um, this is a body of work that I understand the, the least, honestly, but I've just have been making it over the course of 12 years and know that it's going somewhere. This piece is called They Look Like Good Strong Hands, Don't They? Um, and it's a title borrowed from the never ending story from the Rockbiter. Um, 
And I um, originally made, started making these grips 12 years ago when I was making 11 months mourning with the leftover pulp, I would put the pulp in my hands and dry it out just with my bare hands. And I just noticed the, the forms it took kind of bone-like and, and the intensity of emotion that it held. Um, when I started working with the pulp fabric, the fact that the pulp is monochromatic and it's smaller fibers, it really gra um, takes form, the, it really holds all the small details of the shape of my hand. And so I wanted to revisit that project. Um, this was made in 2018. And then the next slide, hold together, fall apart. This is a series that I'm working where I really wanted to activate the grips, move them off of the floor and pair them with their source material. So this, um, this piece is a teal t-shirt that I tore up tied so it's almost like a long line and then marked with different grips throughout the piece and i really think of it as like a sculptural drawing and in making this work i'm i'm paying closer attention to the shirt the collar the sleeves the seams the places that the body was uh, were was and um just the way the jersey drapes and hangs differently than the way torn bed sheets hang mm -hmm. um and i'm really intrigued by the juxtaposition between this work and a piece like Sunset's Midwife, where it's a solid form versus this form that's malleable with the negative space and more raw edges. That's a conversation I'm really excited to go deeper in moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the next piece is sort of my ongoing beast shelter in place project. Um, it's called Tethered. It's a work in progress. And to be totally honest, it took me a long time to get back into the studio once shelter in place started. Logistically and emotionally, I, I could not make work. And so when I did step back into the studio, the first thing I did was I just started tearing bed sheets as a way to release feelings of grief and anxiety and unknowing. And I started tearing the bed sheets and just feeling an overwhelming inability to keep track of time. The pacing of the days even now, it, it feels so irregular and unpredictable. Um, and so I looked to, there's an old, um, a way of measuring speed that sailboats, that boats use called a chip log. And it's a spool of rope and every, I think five meters, there's a knot and they throw it, unfurl it off the back of the boat and, tr and that's how they track this, they measure speed. That's why they call it moving in knots. So this, is a long rope I've made by tying the torn bed sheets together. And I'm measuring six feet intervals. The, the blue tape you see measures every six feet. Um, and this is the spool gathering. At this point, it's still going. It's still going indefinitely, unfortunately. Um, but it's uh, 600 feet long plus. Um, so the next slide. I don't have a definitive um, shape in mind for the installation. This is just sort of a practice of me seeing it live in space. But every six feet, I went and did a grip um, to mark the space. And I'm using my hands in different ways, the limitations of just my two hands to try to make as wide of a variety of shapes as I can. Um, and the piece is called Tethered to highlight the interconnected nature of our well being, even in a time of social distancing. Um, and it's a way of measuring time that's overwhelming, cumulative, non-linear, and with open-ended both in length and form. And I imagine the project keeps going throughout our experience of social distancing and um, just thinking about ways to capture time in unfixed ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I really see so many potential installation forms for this, like knots, coiled, suspended, wrapped, but I am waiting for time and perspective to make any future decisions about that. Right now, it's just about keeping up with the days and, and making the work. Yeah. So this image that you're showing us here, these are the same strips that we saw in the previous slide that are wound around the, the plywood. Yeah. The and in fact, I can show you here is this is the kind of coil, keep growing. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of the pile. Um, yeah, so that's a process shot, that's a later shot, and it's ongoing. Yeah. yeah. 
I'm I'm really just struck by um, your work and the way it's it so beautifully captures um, time as it relates to this moment that we're in, but also um, those moments, um, you know, after you have a child and thinking back to the, the diamond shape piece, um, a few slides back that you made for your friends, um, you know, and I've been, I've been thinking a lot about, um, you know, women giving birth during this time but also feeling in this time, being reminded myself of, like, I was saying to someone, I, I really, especially in those first few months, I felt the way I did when I had a newborn. Mm -hmm. because, you know, I was stuck in the house. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go anywhere. You know, who, who knows what day it was? <laughs> who knows what time it was? Um, and so I really, I don't know, the, the way that you use these materials to kind of um, talk about time in this really poignant way. It's just uh, really striking to me. I'm so glad that resonates with you. I mean, we're all stuck in our heads these days, so it's nice to know. Yeah. Um, we, we do have a couple of questions. I don't know. Did you have, um, I don't remember, did you have some more slides you wanted to get through? That was, that was it. I'd love to answer any questions that people have. Sure. Um, so, we have um, a really interesting one from Paulette Kessler. And um, this is kind of going back to the, um, the rag sorter series. And she asked, how did the history of Jewish men being forced to support their families as peddlers mm. influence your choices at Recology? And she says, I'm thinking of the occupation of poor Jewish men in the 18th, 19th century London. Um, that are kind of the quote unquote old clothes man stereotype? You know, I actually, it's interesting. I did not go there in my research, but uh, the position of the peddler is something I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. When my um, great grandfather immigrated to New York as a 14 year old boy with his brother, his job what the way he got by was as a peddler in the lower east side mm -hmm. so it is a it was a position to me that i had a personal connection with but yeah. i was um more diving into the invisible labor of women as both the the rag collectors in the homes mm -hmm. and the um rag sorters in the paper mills and the thing, it, it's a wild period of time because uh, um, all the paper mills were putting out um, like advertisements, like writing songs and writing poems, encouraging women to save their rags. So for older women, they would appeal to them by saying, if you save your rags, we will make paper out of them and then we'll be able to print Bibles for you. And for younger women, were, they were saying, if you save your rags, we'll be able to print paper and then you will get love letters on them. Like they were called tender, there was one piece that I made called tender epistles. And it was like the appealing to young women's romantic side yeah. for them yeah. to save paper. Um, yeah. Kind of like PSAs, like save your rags, help the effort. Yeah. And, and then it's this weird moment in history where something with no value, because it's scarce and it becomes a raw material, all of a sudden has all this, a, a new set of value uh, assigned to yeah. it. So yeah. there's this, this, there was a moment of scarcity that really intrigued me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really, I, what I love about this time period is that I, I then try to, in my mind, think like, can we, could we retrain ourselves to go back and when we see a Gutenberg Bible, for example, that was printed on rag paper made, in, made during this time, can we retrain our minds to not read the ink, but to see the fibers that hold up the ink and to see all the hands that those fibers move through, all the life experiences that those fibers accumulated in the homes before they were gathered, and then the layers of labor that went into that. Like, it's interesting to me that we've trained ourselves to only read the ink where there's like a whole story of literally holding up history. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's the layer that I'm interested in. It's beautifully put. Beautifully put. And that's as a as a history as a historian myself and, and a lover of history, I, I so appreciate um, when contemporary artists can can kind of you know reach back into history and pull out things like that and make us Think about history it really in, in, in a new way from a new perspective. I think it's really it's a really valuable um, thing. Well, and, and I think in bringing up the 200 year present project, I think, you know, thinking about history, not for nostalgic purposes solely, but in thinking about ways to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I think, you know, one of, one of the ways in, in which we will be able to move forward is if we acknowledge all these contributions of the past mm -hmm. by those who have historically been marginalized um, and realizing everybody's contribution to, to the moment where we are and wherever we may go in the future. Yeah, and reawaken to the many, many layers of invisible labor yeah. that we're building on. Wonderful. Well, I think that we are um, out of time, but I hope um, I hope everyone enjoyed it. I I enjoyed it immensely. Um, I I think we could easily go on for another hour. Um, I would be more than happy to do so. But uh, yeah, we have to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything um, you wanted to say in closing, Julia. I'll say we we had um, not so many other questions as comments about how much people are loving your work and um, hearing you speak about it so eloquently. So just wanted to, to note that. Yeah, I just thank you, Carolyn and Jenny for doing this with me. This is kind of a silver lining opportunity out of this. I've, I've been saying that with Lorraine, my co-curator, that, that um, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And so we haven't done these before because we haven't needed to, but it's it's such a wonderful opportunity. I look forward to them. Um, I think, you know, our participants look forward to them as well. And so this is definitely a, a model I think we'll be continuing um, in the future. And I do look forward to getting to meet you guys in person. So one day. <laughs> yeah, and thank you to everybody who hung in there for the whole conversation. I really appreciate your time, so. Yeah, thank you. Carolyn, do you have any closing remarks for us? Yes, I just want to um, give my thanks to Julia for taking the time today um, to show us your amazing work and your and your process. Uh, it's been so nice to get to know you virtually, and I, I know, like you said, I can't um, can't wait to actually meet you in person. Um, and I think, especially in this current world that we're living in, um, getting to hear about your work and your process. Um, and kind of your philosophy in the art world is really, really amazing and inspirational. So thank you so much.